Friends, welcome to Trinitas Presbyterian Church. I want to say a few things. If you are not already on our regular weekly worship email, that's where we send out our liturgies so that you can either read them from your phone or read them uh, from a printed copy that you make. But if you didn't happen to bring one, Elder Hedgecock will gladly pass these out, so just go ahead and raise your hand and he'll get them around. While he's getting those around, I always like to you know, say a few things before the service, and this week I would like to highlight our worship leader, Michael Morales. You know, when Michael first came to Trinitas, he worked at a little company called GameStop. And the good news is that Michael maximized his stock options. He is now a multimillionaire, so we should... Apparently, the sales staff didn't have stock options, but I was... This is, this is not true. This is all, <laughs> this is all fake news. I was disappointed to see that he forewent such an opportunity. Um, just kidding. I couldn't help myself, Michael. I was apostate at the time. <laughs> it's true. Stuff, it's so. true. He came around. He gained more than the world. He gained uh, salvation. Praise the Lord. It's true. It's true. Well, friends, we are going to begin, as we always do, with the call to worship. If you're wondering what this is about, why we do this, it's because your salvation, our salvation, insofar as we know the Lord, is due to one thing, that God effectually called us, and by his Holy Spirit, we responded. So we begin every single worship service in just the same way, and today we're going to do so with a passage of scripture that whets our appetites for the preaching through of Leviticus. So let's rise to our feet and respond to the call to worship. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wood and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Bow your heads with me. Almighty God, You have called us into a covenant relationship with yourself. You have sealed that covenant with the blood of your own son, Jesus Christ, by whom we are saved. In living God, you have given us the down payment of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, richly guiding us to pray out to you, Abba, Father, to call out in the name of Christ, our Savior, that we might have confidence that you hear us. Living God, this whole worship service is just that. It is a prayer. It is communion and fellowship with you. It is renewal of that covenant into which you have called us. We pray, living God, that this worship service would be holy and pleasing in your sight, not because of the perfection of ourselves or our works or labors, but because it's offered up to you by the hand of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. We ask all of these things, Father, in the name of your Son and by your Holy Spirit, Amen. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not suffer. your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by 
Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, when we respond to God in worship, we bring always our confession of sin. We're sinners saved by a sinless Savior. And though we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we still persist falling prey, falling prey to our appetites for sin and rebellion. We still persist before the last day burdened with an old man, as the Bible describes it. And so it's appropriate that we would come to this place confessing our sins together as a people. And when we're finished reading this corporate confession of sin, we're going to have a moment of silence to confess our sins individually to the Lord. So please read with me this corporate confession of sin printed in your liturgies. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. By the sinful rebellion of our first parent, we have justly incurred spiritual death and ailments of all kinds in our bodies. When our neighbors suffer from chronic pain, physical disfigurement, and terminal illness, it rarely occurs to us that we deserve nothing less. When we consider our redemption It often escapes our minds that we have been rescued from a state of living death and have died to a world that is racing toward outer darkness. Forgive us for dullness of our minds and the hardness of our hearts, and may we be ever mindful of the sheer wonders of our salvation. Brothers and sisters, we believe good news. Please rise to your feet for the assurance of pardon and hear the good news spoken to the leper of the Old Testament and understand that it is spoken to me and you. He shall then sprinkle seven times the one who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean. The priest shall make atonement for him and he will be clean. If you believed in Jesus Christ, you've been set free from a living death. You've been made clean. Let's sing out praises like those who are alive. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turns his face away has wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice 
call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give in But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom. Please be seated. Trinitas Church, after a nine-month-long hiatus, we return to Leviticus. It's the book of Scripture that we were preaching through early in 2020, before everything went wild and we found ourselves all quarantined, like it or not separated from a house of worship. Ironically, what we're about to read about is the condition of a person who's a leper, who according to the scriptures themselves had to be separated from the greater part of the people of Israel. He had to go outside of the camp and live alone. This is one of those portions of scripture that for so many of us seems so foreign, so difficult to understand. We're going to make our way through it today. We're going to see that following Leviticus chapter 10, where two priests failed to honor the distinctions, the ceremonial code that God had set forth, these two priests were killed. And Leviticus 10 says that God will teach his priest to make a distinction between the holy and the profane and between the clean and the unclean. Leviticus 11 through chapter 16, is all about these holiness distinctions. We're going to see today that they have to do with helping us to, to reconcile and to reckon with the effects of the fall and the curse upon mankind. So as we go to these verses and we read something foreign, I hope from the very get-go we can appreciate that this is God instructing his people to know the difference between the way the world should be and to clearly identify the effects of the fall and how they've turned the world upside down. So please, open your Bibles to Leviticus 14. We are going to read through verse 32. And we are going to sing a short verse after it's been read, the glory of pottery, giving thanks to God that these words are his and not the mere word of men. But before we go, we will go with a prayer, asking God to open our hearts and minds to the teaching of his word. Bow your heads with me. O living God, when we have to look death in the face, we can hardly believe it. Because God, frankly, we live our lives trying to forget about it trying to distract ourselves with anything but the reality of this curse that we are under. Our hearts and minds gravitate away from passages like Leviticus 13 through 14. Living God, when we have set before us the concept that our death can only be taken away by very difficult means, Lord, we run still further. I pray, therefore, that you would please arrest the tendency of our hearts to suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. Give us ears to hear 
and eyes to see so that we, Lord God, might be taken back to the foot of the cross knowing how desperately we need it and ever ready to share it. In Jesus' name we pray by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Leviticus 14. Again, we're going to read the first 32 verses. When I'm finished, I'll say this is God's word and you may respond. Thanks be to God. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Now he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out to the outside of the camp. Thus the priest shall look. And if the infection of leprosy has been healed in the leper, then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop for the one who is to be cleansed. The priest shall also give orders to slay the one bird in an earthenware vessel over running water. As for the live bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and the hyssop and shall dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. He shall then sprinkle seven times the one who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird go free over the open field. The one who is to be cleansed shall then wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe in water and be clean. Now afterward, he may enter the camp, but he shall stay outside his tent for seven days. It will be on the seventh day that he shall shave off all his hair. He shall shave his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair. Then he shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and be clean. Now on the eighth day, he is to take two male lambs without defect and a yearling ewe lamb without defect and three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering and one log of oil. And the priest who pronounces him clean shall present the man to be cleansed and the aforesaid before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Then the priest shall take the one lamb and bring it for a guilt offering with the log of oil and present them as a wave offering before the Lord. Next he shall slaughter the male lamb in the place where they slaughter the sin offering and the burnt offering at the place of the sanctuary for the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest shall then take some of the blood of the guilt offering And the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall also take some of the log of oil and pour it into his left palm. The priest shall then dip his right hand finger into the oil that is in his left palm and with his right, his finger sprinkle some of the oil seven times before the Lord. Of the remaining oil which is in his palm, the priest shall put some of the, on the right lobe, right earlobe of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the blood of the guilt offering. While the rest of the oil that is in the priest's palm, he shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed, so the priest shall make atonement on his behalf before the Lord." The priest shall next offer the sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from his uncleanness. Then afterward, he shall slaughter the burnt offering. The priest shall offer up the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus, the priest shall make atonement for him and he will be clean. But if he is poor and his means are insufficient, then he is to take one lamb for a guilt offering as a wave offering to make atonement for him and one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering and a log of oil, and two turtle doves or two pigeons which are within his means, the one shall be a sin offering and the other a burnt offering. Then the eighth day he shall bring them for his cleansing to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord. The priest shall take the lamb of the guilt offering and the log of oil, and the priest shall offer them for a wave offering before the Lord." Next, he shall slaughter the lamb of the guilt offering. And the priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the, right, on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall also pour some of the oil into his left palm. And with his right hand finger, the priest shall sprinkle some of the oil 
that is in his left palm seven times before the Lord. The priest shall then put some of the oil that is in the palm on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot on the place of the blood of the guilt offering. Moreover, the rest of the oil that is in the priest's palm he shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed to make atonement on his behalf before the Lord. He shall then offer one of the turtle doves or young pigeons, which are within his means. He shall offer what he can afford, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering, together with the grain offering. So the priest shall make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the one to be cleansed. This is the law for him in whom there is an infection of leprosy, whose means are limited for his cleansing. This is God's word. Please be seated. Friends, how many of us, if we're honest, would say that in our annual Bible reading plans, when we hit Leviticus 14, we get two or three verses into it, and we say, there's one thing I don't understand, there's another thing I don't understand, and another thing, and eventually, you're just reading words. How many of you have found yourself there, or maybe did just moments ago? These ideas are challenging, Last year, we spent a great deal of time speaking about the five main offerings that God required of his people, their nuances, their differences, and here in this passage, we have all but one of them applied and prescribed. Finding our way around Leviticus can be difficult, and let me give you this basic scheme to help you tremendously to understand the portion of scripture that we find ourselves in. Leviticus 11 through 16 can be understood as a commentary on the curses that mankind incurred in the fall. Consider this with me. The very first curse that God speaks after Adam and Eve fall into sin is pronounced on the serpent, an animal that he would carry about in the dust of the earth. Leviticus chapter 11 is full of dietary laws distinguishing unclean animals from clean animals, animals that are like the serpent from those who are not. The second curse pronounced in Genesis chapter 3 is actually on the woman, Eve, and it pertains to the burden and the pain that would accompany childbirth. Leviticus chapter 12 is about the uncleanness incurred by a woman in childbirth. The curse pronounced upon the man, the curse pronounced upon the man has to do with the dust of the earth, the fact that man will work the ground, that he will sweat from his brow, and that he will return to dust. Leviticus chapter 13 through 14 is all about a skin disease that like sweat erupts from under the skin and reduces a man to looking like a white, snow-covered, dusty being on his way back to dust. This is where we find ourselves right now. And to make things even more clear, after Adam and Eve incur the curses of the fall, God makes for them garments made out of animal skins. And we're told about leprosy in chapter 13 and 14 of Leviticus that garments can also incur leprosy. Adam and Eve are then thrust out of the garden, their natural home. We're told in the latter half of Leviticus 14 that buildings or houses can incur a curse of leprosy within their basic elements. And we're also told that after Adam and Eve are thrust out of the garden, they begin to procreate. 
Leviticus 15 tells us about the uncleanness incurred, incurred through those parts of the body with which we procreate. The final thing we read about in this holiness code of Leviticus 11 through 16 is the cleansing of God's house on the day of atonement. Because God's house, as it were, it too is under the threat of falling under the curse of the fall. And it too must be cleansed. With that understanding in mind, we can appreciate this basic idea. The Mosaic laws pertaining to cleanness and uncleanness would force you as an Israelite to regularly consider that we as humanity are under a curse. A tremendous burden. The very worst of these uncleanliness laws pertains to leprosy. Leprosy is the worst ritually unclean condition in which you can find yourself because it is the very closest to pure death. Many of you might have the idea that leprosy is Hansen's disease. A lot of people think that it is. Hansen's disease is one where your nerve endings begin to lose their power to feel and therefore a person's body will knock around on things and they won't notice it and eventually, eventually their bone structure will break down. That very clearly is not what Leviticus is talking about. It's probably an unknown disease that might not even be with us today anymore. Diseases change. But here were the characteristics as described in the previous chapter that we didn't read. The leper has to have some sort of disease on the skin that goes deeper than the skin and into the flesh. It will make for hair discoloration. It will turn the hair of the flesh where leprosy is white. Leprosy bursts out from under the skin like sweat. Like that part of the curse laying upon man. Not only that, but leprosy is a white, scaly, spreading condition. And the leper will often be described as being white as snow. You think of snow with its Little, tiny, minuscule, dusty pieces accruing and accumulating. The picture of the leper is a person who is, as it were, walking death on his way to dust. This is made very clear in Numbers chapter 12 where Miriam, upon opposing the central authority of Moses and trying to gain it for herself, is struck with leprosy. Listen to how she's described. Miriam was leprous as snow. Then Aaron said to Moses, Oh, do not let her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes forth from his mother's womb. It's a very intense picture. A stillborn baby's flesh is the picture that it's pointing to. And it is something that easily sheds away. It's a picture of death. One thing about leprosy in the Bible you'll notice is that every single leper you encounter in the Bible is male, except for one, it was Miriam, in this passage, precisely as she is opposing and attempting to usurp Moses' authority. And then she is only a leper for one week because Moses intercedes for her and it's taken away. Every other leper is a man, again, reinforcing this picture of the curse being associated Associated with the curse laying especially on Adam. When someone gets leprosy, the verbiage used in the Bible to describe it is that that person is struck with it as if by an especial divine curse against them. There are some people where we know the specific reason for why they incurred this particular scourge. And the usual crime for incurring leprosy that we read of in the Bible is twofold. Opposition to God-ordained authority in transgressing boundaries. What does that remind you of? If not the fall of Adam and Eve, where they question God's authority and they transgress the boundaries of the garden taking the forbidden fruit. We just saw that with Miriam. She opposes Mosaic authority. She crosses a line. She's divinely struck. We read about a king in Israel by the name of Uzziah, who was otherwise good, but began to think 
too highly of himself and he decided to go into God's house where only the priests were to go. And the priests come out and oppose him. And we read that he is immediately struck with leprosy on the forehead. It breaks out the very same locale where God threatens that man will sweat from the brow. And he's never able to go into God's house again because a leper. Another instance where a person incurs leprosy is when Elisha the prophet actually heals a foreign general of a Syrian army from leprosy. But his servant Gehazi says, Elisha, we really ought to charge this man for what you did for him. We ought to make him give us a gift. Gehazi wants to take something that belongs to God, which is credit. He wants to cross this boundary and take for himself what is not his. And as a result, Elisha causes the leprosy of that cleansed general of Syria to fall on his servant Gehazi. Again, he will not honor authority and he crosses boundaries. Now, there are many other people in the Bible who are lepers, but who do not commit a crime that immediately is the obvious ground on which they occur it. Many others. Naaman himself, that Syrian general, we don't know why he had leprosy. There are four lepers in the time of Ahab who actually, actually protect the city. And in Jesus' day, there are countless lepers, and we don't know why they have this divine scourge. Not only that, but one of the most righteous men in the Bible... Job was almost certainly smitten with leprosy. Listen to how Job is described in the book of Job. He says this in chapter 7, verse 5. My flesh is clothed with worms and a crust of dirt. My skin hardens and runs. His interlocutors who are talking with him speak of Job and they say this. His skin is devoured by disease. The firstborn of death devours his limbs. Job, not being an Israelite, he didn't have to go out from his society and dwell on the outskirts of the camp. They didn't have the same laws as Israel. But he was still surely a walking image of death. This tells us that Adam's transgression, his trespass alone, is sufficient grounds for every single one of us to carry on in a painful unendurable condition of living death. The societal situation for an Israelite only exacerbated the suffering. The leper had to alienate himself from the camp of the people. This isn't because the disease was fundamentally something that you could catch contagious. Because we'll see that a leper who's leprous all over his body doesn't have to quarantine. It's because of the cultic function of this disease to represent death itself on the outskirts of society, alienated from their fellow man. They would have to live in the outskirts of a society, and we are told that by law, they had to tear their clothing, dishevel their hair, cover their face, and wail, unclean, unclean. The leper virtually had to become a haunting figure dwelling in the wilderness with beasts and desert creatures who themselves were images for demons. Isaiah 13, describes the situation when a city is toppled and its population leaves and when there, it's become rubble in wilderness, it says in Isaiah 13, desert creatures will lie down there and their houses will be full of owls or howling creatures. Ostriches will also live there and shaggy goats will frolic there. Hyenas will howl in their fortified towers and jackals in their luxurious places. When the leper goes to the outskirts of society and has to cry out, unclean, unclean, it's like he has joined the unclean beasts. Revelation ties all of this together in Revelation 18.2. It describes the fallen city Babylon in the same terms as a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean bird and unclean and hateful bird. The leper, as it were, joins 
the outskirts of society and the realm of the dead. What a frightening thought. See, we all idealize the wilderness. That's because when we go in the wilderness, we wear our REI vests, take our hiking boots with us, our designer tents, and real world food to eat. If any one of you actually tried to live in the wilderness, you would find yourself incredibly afflicted with the very need to survive in addition to only your thoughts to converse with, which very shortly would leave you feeling rather insane. I want to tell you all something, friends. Israel was forced to reflect on the curse by God's law and his ceremonial requirements. Guess what? That requirement to reflect on the curse, to acknowledge it, to identify it, no less rests on you and I, even though we've been set free from certain burdens of the law. All you need to do, friends, is drive the I-5 down toward Seattle and you will see people living in tents on the outskirts of society. And if you walk those streets, you will hear people wailing for no reason at all. And what do you tell yourself when you see these things? Do you say, how unfortunate? Do you say, I'm glad that's not me? What do you tell your kids? Last January, for our daughter Nicaea's birthday, we took a bunch of girls down to a ride down in Seattle. And while we were driving down there, I had the Zion girls and the Burns girls in my car as we were driving. And we saw all of these encampments. We had a long talk about the curse and sin. Do you understand that that condition of humanity is something that not one of us deserves better than? If you look at this condition, whether in Israel and the cultic function of it, or you look at this condition in our own society, I hope you never conclude that it's cruel for God to accentuate the curse and to isolate people. No, friends, I'll tell you what, what would be cruel would be for God to not magnify it and force you and I to look at it. We read in the parable of the rich man, a rich man goes to hell. And he says, let me or someone else just go back and tell everyone up there how bad this place is. And you know what? It's spoken to him. All of Your brothers and sisters and family members have the law and the prophets. They ought to know how bad a living condition of death ought to be. I'll tell you right now, one of the most gracious things that God does for humanity is he lets us have a tiny window in this life to just how dark a condition of living death can be. Lazarus begged that he, God would give mankind some window of insight into it. Let me tell you something. The condition of the leper is the answer to Lazarus' request. You all ought to understand that there is a way to live that is death. That's not an unconscious spirit leap or a rest. There is a way to live that is death. Some people have tasted it in great measure in this life, but apart from a savior, we will all taste it in infinite measure in the world to come. There is something worse than death, friends. It's the living dead. I will tell you furthermore that you ought not to carry about with a sense of guilt that you are not currently suffering the same measure of deathly living as others. It is absolutely imperative that we continue to worship insofar as we have life in our veins, insofar as we have good health in our bodies, that we continue to gather for worship because let me tell you something. It provides hope. A living portrait of life exuberant, overflowing with joy. Guess what? It was good news to the leper that although I reside outside of the camp, inside that camp, there God dwells. There his people worship him with life and vitality. 
In this age of quarantine, friends, it is a service to all of society that we continue to worship. Our brothers and sisters who really are quarantined, especially in old folks' homes, and cannot get out. But good news it is for them that worship of God in song and praise did never cease even if they are estranged from it. So it was for the leper. As we move on to consider the leper's condition, the good news is this. The leper can be set free. And the law memorializes this. There are two ways that you could be set free from the ceremonial curse of leprosy. The one is by total spread of that leprosy over every inch of your body. We talked a lot about that a year ago. But there's a second way. And that's by divine healing. That's what we read about in this passage. And it gives you, us, the greatest insight into the ministry of pastors and in the Old Testament of priests. The Old Testament priests did not, by this ceremony of birds and bulls and blood and oil, heal the leper. The leper had to be healed by God in the priest's ministry. It was to show the leper a divine interpretation of what really happened. We read in verses two through three of our passage, now this is the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Now he shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall look and if the infection of leprosy has been healed in the leper, and he goes on to tell you the right to perform. But did you get that? God's healing comes first. The ceremony second. In a book that many of us have probably not read, because it's something of a dry read, it's called the Book of Church Order, we read this about what ministers do. The jurisdiction of the church courts is only ministerial and declarative and relates to doctrines and precepts. What it means when it says that a pastor's, pastor's ministry is declarative is that we as ministers do not heal people by some inherent power in us. We declare. We examine we pronounce when a profound healing has already occurred. That's what a declarative ministry is. It's hard for many, especially in the context of counseling or in the context of asking me or another minister to talk to your unbelieving loved ones, it's hard for people to understand that we have no ability whatsoever to affect an ontological change in a person's heart. We don't have that power. It's frustrating when people come to me it's frustrating for them for marriage counseling and they realize that Brant cannot change my spouse's heart. Why did we come here, people think. We come here, we come to church, we come to the sacraments, we come to the preaching of the word, not because of my power and ability to change, but because of God's power and ability to work before, after, and in the midst of all of it. And it's paradoxical. Friends, I've been there at the moment when people accepted Jesus Christ. I've been there. I've walked people through a sinner's prayer. We have a man in this church, Ryan Matson. I remember very well the day when I was at his house. And we prayed. This man received Jesus. I'll tell you what, friends. I did not feel like I had opened the jar of Ryan's heart. In fact, I didn't even feel like someone had loosened it beforehand. I felt like the lid was off the jar. And all I was saying to Ryan was, it's time to receive that Savior who's opened it up. This is the picture of what the priest is doing. He is there to guide and explain and to enlighten what God alone can do. This is very similar to baptism in so many respects, friends. When you are baptized at church or in any context, that baptism is not the thing that fundamentally changes you as if there were magic in the water. In fact, Jesus in the New Testament gives us a very good picture 
of what it's like. See, Jesus heals a leper in Luke 5, 14, and then he says to the leper, go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing. Very clearly, that offering cannot be for his deliverance from leprosy because he's already been healed. Ceremonial rite of cleansing is tied to the reality but neither the priest nor the rite in itself has the power to effect it. Only God does. Similar things are said by the same Luke about your baptism. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It does not mean in order to obtain the forgiveness of sins, but in connection with that grand forgiveness that God showers down on you like these waters declare. But now... Let's look at the details of this right, because it's magnificent. Let me walk you through this. The first part of this wonderful right of cleansing, which is God's declaration to the leper about what really happened, the first wonderful thing is its location. This is one of a few ceremonial, even sacrificial rites that have to occur outside of the camp. Almost every other sacrificial rite will happen right outside of the doorway of the tent of meeting to communicate to the worshiper that this blood gives you access to God himself. It walks you through a door. But this one's different. See, when a sin offering would be offered in most contexts, the blood would be sprinkled, sprinkled on the altar, which represented the earth in which the Israelites lived, an earth which they had stained by their sin. But there's no sprinkling on the altar for this leper. And here, my friends, would appear to be why. The leper is so close to death that he virtually does not inhabit the earth anymore. You're already all but dead. Therefore, a different sort of rite has to occur than most of the other sacrifices. It's a rite that's a whole lot more like circumcision, which doesn't have to happen near the house of God because it is a point of entry from a world living in death to the people of God living by life with him. You're gonna see it's much more like the first Passover and it is a picture of regeneration, passage from death to life. This bird right, it requires seven or eight different tools, the first of which are two live, clean birds. And the emphasis, especially in the Hebrew, on every element in this service is on life, life-giving agents. It's a bit redundant afterwards to say get two live birds when you're going to be told to kill them in a moment. Why emphasize live your translations will say that this rite will have to happen over running water. They didn't have water faucets back then, friends, so what does this mean? Well, literally, the Hebrew says, over living water. Living water in the Bible is water taken from something moving, a stream or a spring, not a well, not a lake. Blood is involved in this rite. And Leviticus 17, 11 says life is in the blood. Moreover, you're supposed to have scarlet or crimson wool involved in this rite. It's a bright red wool reminding us of the blood. Just the same, cedar, wood must be involved in this rite. And it's naturally red, cedar is. And it's remarkable for being resistant to rot. It is a wood that is especially alive. Hyssop must be involved. This was a plant that was aromatic, had medicinal properties, and had bright purple flowers. The scarlet, the cedar, and the hyssop. These pieces were probably made into a special tool for sprinkling. Probably hyssop, which is a flower that's not particularly strong, was bound to a cedar stick by a crimson piece of wool thread and to be made into something with which a person could be sprinkled. 
Many of you may remember in the Passover rite, in order to keep the angel of death from entering a home and to allow the angel of the Lord to enter the home, you would take hyssop branches and sprinkle the blood over the house. What we have is the idea that this leper, though he dwells far from the house of God, is by the grace of God met with his cleansing agency supernaturally. It's as if the arm of the Lord, like a cedar branch, like a branch stretching out of his house, has reached out and cleansed and touched this leper and made him new. It's as if God is saying the same thing he did in Numbers 11.23, is the Lord's arm too short? This special tool was a declaration that it is not. The cleansing rite would go like this. You would take one of the two birds and it would be killed either by the leper, his friends, or some assistant to the priest. All throughout the Levitical code, this is a substitutionary death. It is a picture that the death of the leper has gone to another who dies in his stead. This living death has been taken from him. And then the blood of that bird is poured into clean water. And the picture is... Not only that the leper's death has been taken, but that the life of another has been turned into a cleansing agent, water that cleans, water that can wipe away all that was there, this deadness of skin. And that water would be sprinkled onto the leper with a tool that can absorb death on the one hand and turn it into a life-giving agent of water. The man would be sprinkled seven times. He would shave to mark out a total discontinuity with his past. All of his hair on his body would be removed. It would be like a rebirth, my friends. It would be a passage from death to life. But there's a second bird who would also be dipped into that blood and death. And your translation says something that sounds rather nice, that that other bird shall go free over the open field. Well, that's rather flowery, but I'll tell you, the Hebrew isn't so bright. It's really more like that bird shall be cast out, away from God's house over the open field, sent away. The picture is of this bird carrying away the death of the leper into deeper nether regions like the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. Friends, let me tell you, new life always involves departure from old company men and demons and even your old self when you receive the Lord and you're reborn. You are, as it were, put to flight in opposite directions from your old self and that death under which you carried This man, after this initial rite signifying rebirth, lives one week in the capacity of not an Israelite, but a God-fearing foreigner. What that means is he can walk into the camp, but he can't go into his home. He's not an Israelite again yet. He was dead, he's been made alive, but he's yet to become part of the priestly people of God. For a week, he is in this middle zone between those who are saved and those who are part of the priestly people of God in the Old Testament. Friends, let me tell you what all of this ought to have left every leper doing. See, when this man came home, undoubtedly his kids would have said, Dad's back. Dad's back. We're so lucky. He's home. He was smitten. He was gone. This right should have left dad with a testimony that was different than dad was lucky. This right should have left dad with a testimony. Son, we're not just lucky. God absorbed my death like a sponge. He cast my death away from me like a bird going as far as the east is from the west. God reached his strong arm out of his house, out of his temple, from which I was estranged, and he gave me new life. In the New Testament, 
people actually met that real arm of God, that real tool that could absorb death and then sprinkle life back on you. His name was Jesus Christ. When he cleansed a man of his leprosy, Jesus said to that man, go to the temple as a testimony for what I've done for you. Trinitas Church, the Apostle Paul would have every single one of you know that in your nature with which you were born, you are a leper, a living dead man. Ephesians 2, 1, 4, and 5 says, as you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air. That foul, unclean bird of a demon formerly walked, but God being rich in mercy, even when we were dead, dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. He says the Gentiles in particular, people not born of Abraham, maybe that's you. Remember that you Gentiles were separate from Christ. You weren't in his house. You weren't in his camp. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I simply ask you, believer, what testimony do you have about how you passed from death to life? Do you tell your children? Do you tell your neighbor? Do you tell anyone? Do you even tell yourself that I was dead? But by the mighty arm of God reaching down out of his heavenly abode, by his spirit I was made alive. This picture of the leper, it's a picture for, frankly, every believer, even after they have been saved. There will be believers who, due to their backsliding, due to addiction, due to abuse, have to be estranged from their family. And by a course, a course of alienating that sin from themselves, they may return. But when they get home, and maybe this has been you, Your sin having separated you from your family when you get home. I hope you have a testimony, friends. I was a walking dead man. But the power of God reached out, even of his church, that place where we all go to find him. No, he came out and he found me. This I know. I was dead. But I'm alive. The remarkable thing is that after this wonderful rite with birds, scarlet, cedar, God actually requires that this cleansed man offer the four standard offerings of Israel at the heart of which is something called a reparation offering, an offering that you give to repair what you've ruined. Friends, does that seem a little bit cruel that a person afflicted with a terrible disease has to make some sort of offering to repair anything at all? Doesn't that just seem like adding insult to injury? The person's already been harmed. The remainder of this wonderful rite centers around a thing called a reparation offering. It's to happen on the eighth day. What else in the Bible happens on the eighth day? A circumcision or a rebirth whereby you leave the world and enter the people of God. See, this man who had been dead must undergo the same sort of activity as a new convert virtually. And it centers on a reparation. This tells us something. Every single one of us is culpable. We're culpable when we neglect or are even unable to perform that which is required of us. See, a reparation offering, if you recall, it's an offering of admission that I can't fully repay what I've done. It has a transmuted payment. If you stole something, you don't have to make as intense a retribution as you otherwise would. And finally, this offering is a divine prayer that God would repair what I have left broken. See, the leper has been unable to perform his duty to his neighbor, his parents, and his wife, and his children. He's been unable to do what's required of him, and that hurts. And I'm going to tell you something. If you ever have a chronic illness, you're a mom, a dad, a son, or a daughter, all one of those things, 
you're going to feel a burden that I haven't been able to do much. You're going to feel pain. I haven't been able to give my kids and my family what I always wanted to. Because you know that what it means to be a man is to have a calling and a burden laying on you. For this reparation, the leper has to offer a male lamb which will feed the priests who have facilitated this entire process. Do you understand? The priests have had to inspect this man perhaps several times. He has to give an offering, the majority of which will go to feed that very ministry which recognized his leprosy and declared it clean. He will then have blood applied to his own body, which is very unique, not normal in the sacrificial system, except when you're coming from the outside to the inside. And so this man will be consecrated for service, and oil is laying on his hand as well that is on the priest, that's on the altar, and it expresses solidarity. You are now again part of this priestly people. You're back And then he offers all the normal offerings, a sin offering, a grain offering, and a burnt offering. What this teaches us is about absence and repair. Friends, if the leper needs to pray for repair because of his absence due to a sickness and illness, how much more the rest of us? I simply ask everyone here, every parent especially, have you found yourself mentally emotionally, or even physically absent from your family and your duties. It doesn't matter if you've had a tough season of work. It doesn't matter what the rationale is. Repair needs to be made. You've taken something. Your circumstances might have taken something. Have you actually been estranged from your family because of sin-related absence? Maybe you have needed to go to treatment due to an addiction problem. You've been verbally or physically abusive, so you're away from your home. We need as badly as the leper to appeal to the one God who can repair the damage we've left behind. And I'll tell you what, if you use your circumstances as a reason to not pray for repair or to acknowledge its need to be repaired, if you use self-pity as an excuse for those sorts of intercessions, friends, you are in one of the most dangerous positions imaginable if you make self-pity an excuse to not acknowledge what you failed to do and what you need the Lord God himself to intervene to do in your stead. Friends, finally, I'll just have you know that this right points us to Jesus Christ above so many others. Let me ask you something. Was Jesus crucified inside of the temple grounds, or was he crucified and died outside of God's normal place of sacrifice? Which is it? Outside, friends. That right there should tell you that Jesus' death looks especially like this right with the two birds. And I'm gonna point you to some things that maybe you have never seen before. When Jesus is on the cross in John 19, 28 to 29, it says this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture said, I'm thirsty. And we read that a jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Let me tell you what's happening here. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus meets his shadow again and again. See, all the rites of the Old Testament were told they're shadows and that Jesus is the reality. Jesus meets the high priest. He's not a very good shadow. He kind of distorts Jesus. Jesus meets the temple. It's an unclean place and unlike himself, it distorts Jesus. On this occasion, Jesus meets that tool that can absorb sin and sprinkle life And that tool is again being misused, not not 
sprinkle life on Jesus, that tool is filled with sour wine, something blasphemous, and it's put in his mouth. And Jesus kisses that tool, if you will. And he puts it in the grave. These tools and these rites of cleansing, here is the shadow, I'm the reality. And after that day, when Jesus is on a cross, on a cedar, himself a sponge of human sin, covered not in crimson wool but in his own blood he shows himself to be that tool that goes out of the temple takes people's death and replaces it with life and if you didn't get it already John alone tells us that after he had died the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out just like the rite of cleansing a leper, over living water and blood. This is God's way of telling you that Jesus is one mighty and mysterious being. All throughout John, you know the I am statements. I am the bread, I am the door, I'm the way, I'm the light, I'm the shepherd, I'm the vine. He could have just as well said, I am the sponge, I am the one thing in reality that can absorb your death and turn it back, turn it back into life. That's who Jesus is, friends. I will tell you something about this book of Leviticus. If you doubted its ability to illuminate your Savior, friends, you don't know the sort of God you're dealing with. He doesn't mess around with his words. He doesn't mince his words. He does not dumb down his word. Nothing in his word is without a mighty power to instruct, exhort, a tool through which God saves. In the New Testament, we're told this incredible thing that there is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Many of you might have gone for years after reading that. Yeah, so what? Big deal if there's one baptism. It is a big deal because we just read in the Old Testament about a rite that had multiple baptisms, a life that is marked by multiple cleansing. And through Jesus Christ, the reality, friends, there is just one. And our one baptism signifies all that this old baptism did. We saw first the lepers brought from death to life, seven splashes of water via this hyssop rod. Then he had to bathe himself and wash his clothing. And then on the seventh day, he had to do the same thing again. And then to pass from life to the national priesthood, he had to have another bath, another threefold sprinkling with blood and oil. And we're told in the New Testament, our baptism is one. Through Christ, in that spirit baptism he dispenses, our sin is absorbed, his life-giving blood is poured out. That's regeneration. Our debt is paid, our reparation is made by him in full reparation. We don't look for another. Our old man is separated from us like a bird fleeing in the opposite direction and the fallen world is crucified to us. We obtain full citizenship in the national priesthood of the church. We obtain the fullest access to God like the Aaronic priests who had their own baptism. There's one baptism. We are freed from the repeated application of any such cleansing rite, but we are not free to forget it. We are not free to forget it. I hope you remember your baptism today. I hope you know that it's connected to that wonderful salvation that God dispenses by his grace alone through faith alone. I hope you rejoice in it. Bow your heads with me. Living God, we have underestimated you. We have underestimated your word. We have been dull to the reality of our curse. And frankly, God, we do everything we can to forget it. May we not be less reflective than your people of old. God, when you give us these dastardly insights into just how dark our sin and living death can be, may we be inspired the more to rejoice in our salvation, to share the reality of what you have done. 
we speak of it with our spouses and our children and our roommates and our friends. May we not be like those lepers healed from an ailment in their flesh who had no testimony to share but took it for granted. May we go out with a testimony. We ask these things, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, and by your mighty Holy Spirit. Amen.